Okay, we are now recording. Okay, so first on the agenda, is the architecture. So Michael? Hi. Uh, so we have had another eight or nine meetings since ITF 108. Um, and um, I guess we spent a reasonable amount of time quibbling over words and exactly what do they mean. Um, so some of the changes may seem very trivial, uh, but there may be actually more than an hour behind some things going back and forth. Uh, we have two issues that are still kind of open. One that we've said we won't fix. We think that it belongs in a new document and we've encouraged another document to be created that, uh, for this. Um, 104 pull requests closed and we had a couple of other new people drop into some of the calls, but most of the calls have been a fairly core group of eight or nine people. Um, next slide. We think we're done. Posted the document 07 last uh, Friday after our call. Uh, we don't have any more calls scheduled at this point um, as we think we're really done. So the major changes in 07 is we've added this section called reference values. Um, and um, Next slide, please. And this is the sort of major changes. We had two new definitions. Uh, make it bigger on your screen if you can, I guess. Um, and, uh, and we changed this core diagram, this kind of the first conceptual, the first diagram in the whole bloody document. Uh, we've added this reference value provider uh, to kind of really make it clear what's happening. Um, just to some some comment about the the diagram. There's in the the things in with box the boxes with stars are not normatively standardized in this document. The, we assume they exist in some fashion, but we don't assume that this working group at this time will necessarily standardize those in those interactions. The boxes with the dashes, the solid lines around them, and those arrows that connecting them, those are the pieces that we think that this architecture normatively standardizes and that this working group is attempting to standardize. So the, the ARCMARC evidence and the ARCMARC attestation results are the parts that we think um, are the major, major outputs of this working group at this time um, there. Um, and the other parts, um, could be subject to standardization at a future time or in a particular venue or other things like this. We're not saying they're not important. What we're saying is that they're just, they don't, we don't think that we can get consensus on that kind of stuff. Next slide, please. So a whole bunch of new text about the verifier, um, about how does it acquire all of the things that it needs to do uh, to verify things, um, about things like um, whether the device is physically in possession of people or not, uh, or is specifically not in possession. And there's interesting cases where uh, physical possession adds to its trustworthiness in cases where it removes from its trustworthiness. Um, and, uh, that's, uh, about kind of this, the, the, the circle of trust, which is in some sense, those arrow, those non-standardized arrows where the manufacturer has to put something into the attester and then provide the verifier with a thing that it allows it to verify that it's the thing that it put in. So typically these are provisioned key symmetric, asymmetric keys. Um, although the case has been made that in some cases, in some scenarios, they may be symmetric keys uh, at, with particular um, uh, constraints put on them. And that's partly the place where we said, well, you know, we just we don't want to we don't want to say one or the other that a specific environment is going to make this the case. Next slide, please. 
Um, we had some edits about the freshness. This link uh, and the slides will take you to the full diff. Um, and I'm not going to really go to go through that. There's there's a lot of small little changes that I would encourage you to review. Um, and essentially, we think that this document is ready for a working group last call. Last slide. That was it, I think. Uh, was Michael, can I say something about this one? Please. I, I just want to summarize the main addition here since the last interim meeting was the addition of uh, using handles for freshness rather than because before we had two possibilities that we walked through. One was using uh, timestamps, which require synchronized clocks, and one that uses uh, nonces, which of course has an extra you know round trip to send the nonce you know, with the challenge and then, you know, include that in the evidence, um, but you got to have an extra round trip to go and fetch the nonce to put include in your evidence. And then the addition this time was adding the handle stuff that uh, Pink had originally proposed in a different draft. And we, and we incorporated that into the, um, uh, into the main set of possibilities here. So now there's three different possibilities to walk through, which are for different use cases, like you actually have a source of time and so on. And so we talk about that. So that's the, the main change on this one is just uh, adding a third uh, set of example type. And uh, Hank did summarize that to the uh, to the list in between last entry meeting and this entry meeting. Yeah, and actually some of that was actually done in 05 to 06, um, but, but... Thank you for right, but it was before the last interim meeting. So just it was before the last, you're right. It's you're yeah. you're absolutely right. Since the last interim meeting, yes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Or, or, or since since it's interim meeting. Since IETF one oh eight or seven or whatever. IETF one oh eight. We absolutely have added the handles and thank you for catching that 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 point. So you may want to look at O five to O seven um if you haven't read the document for a while. Okay, sounds good. So what I can do is issue, I, I did see other reviewers provide comments too. So what I can go ahead and do rather than asking who's read the document, because I know people have, um, I can go ahead and issue a, a working group last call. Um, given holidays and stuff, I might give it three, three weeks or so. Good progress, guys. All right. Any other comments for this one? Going once, going twice? Nope. All right. So I think up next is Lawrence on the EAT draft. Yep. Hello. Uh, you can hear me? Yes. OK. Uh, so the next slide, please. So uh, this is this is to talk about how the verification key is identified. So when a verifier you know receives uh, attestation evidence like an eat token, um, they need to verify the signature on it. So uh, in order to verify the signature, they need to know what key to use. Uh, symmetric or asymmetric. Um, so there's got to be some way that they figure out which key it is. Um, uh, you can, uh, uh, so this is the, the main point here is, you know, what goes into EAT that identifies the key. Um, so this is kind of a follow on to what I discussed, I think, in the last time I presented, which I think was was the last IETF. Um, and um, you know about how the how the keys work for for uh, verification. Um, the other thing that's important here is you know I, I'm looking ahead uh, here to the idea that someday um, there should be interoperation between different vendors of uh, different attesters and different vendors of different verifiers, kind of like there is interoperation with TLS, you know, uh, in web browsers. I mean, there's lots of different. Um, vendors uh, lots of different CAs lots of different websites and lots of different uh, web br browser vendors uh, and they all interoperate I'm hoping that we have some sort of interoperation like that for uh, attestation that seems like a long ways to go but um, that's kind of what I'm thinking about here um, 
Uh, so the main point of this this picture here was just to show that um, you know this is after the verification key ID, um, or how the verifier identifies the key. Uh, next next slide. Um, so this was the slide from last time I presented, <clears throat> you know, showing that you can have uh, public keys or symmetric keys for or a verification service, and you might have the transfer of the the key from the manufacturer to the verifier. It might be infrequent, or it might happen on every verification. Um, so I won't go over this in any detail today. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this was this is a, a taxonomy I came up with of how uh, the, the verifier finds out about what key to use. So I got four different ways that a verifier can find out what key uh, they're using. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to go over these in some detail, and I I, I want to have some discussion on some on these um, get, to get some feedback. Um, and the the proposal is to add text describing this, or maybe maybe this table or something like this to the eat document. Um, so um, I'm going to so to start with the key ID. Um, so the first thing you can do is just have a key ID. Um, and the example here is the COSE uh, key ID header parameter. And, and in fact, the proposal would, would be just to reuse the COSE key ID header parameter. Um, so the, in this case, all you're doing is identifying a key uh, with a, a, a byte string with no internal structure. Um, and, um, you know, that, that works for symmetric keys or asymmetric keys or, or all kinds of different algorithms or whatever. So this is basically just this op option <clears throat> is simply reusing the COSE uh, key ID header parameter. Um, second option um, would be to um, use a UR, URI to identify the key. So what would go? What would happen is that in in the eat token there would be a URI somewhere, uh, probably in the COSE, uh, probably a COSE header parameter um, that would identify how you get the key. So then you you do the the HTTP uh, fetch, the content type of what you get back would be tell you what the uh, format of the key is. So you could do lots of different types of keys here. Um, this could include fetching a certificate, and maybe that certificate is even an endorsement. Um, so the the um, I think there's a lot of overlap with the the COSE X509 draft when the key is an X509 certificate because it's a public key. So that's one reason I've been I got uh, much more involved in detail in COSE X509 in the last couple of weeks. Um, so the main proposal there would be to reuse COSE X509, um, but if it's one uh, the, the one step further, if it's not a a um, uh, a uh, X509 certificate, then we have to, to have a, a different kind of URI uh, for something that's a little different. Um, okay, the third option here is to base the key identification on the claims. So you don't have any explicit key identifier or URI or anything like that. You just look at the claims and inside the claims, there's a, a claim, one claim, maybe two or three claims uh, that uh, you use to identify the key. Um, so this is actually what ARM PSA is using. Uh, they base it off of the device ID or UID. So you just look inside the the um, the payload, parse the payload. Um, you get the UEID out, and then you use that as a key ID. So. Uh, the nice thing about this is in terms of size efficiency, it's definitely the best because 
you're just reusing some data that's already there. Um, uh, and you know, it kind of parallels to uh, the, the key idea in a lot of ways. Um, one of the things that I think is a little awkward with this one is that you have to decode the, the signed payload before the verification. Um, some people might think there's a little bit of a security concern there. Um, it also makes the software stack messy because now you've got to, uh, you know, decode the payload before signature verification, and then you got to decode the, the you got to decode the cose without verifying the signature because you don't have the key. Decode the payload, uh, the eat payload, then you end up with the key ID, and then you have to go back and redo all that. So, it, and some of the software stacks are a little bit. Uh, you know, you have to have a, a way to decode COSE and EAT without signature verification to, to make that work. Um, then uh, the final, the fourth option is to put the verification key uh, in the attestation evidence, evidence inside the EAT token. So this is basically, you know, attaching uh, an X509 certificate to your, uh, to EAT. Um, uh, you can do this with COSE X509. Um, then, since it's a, you you will have to uh, do the the chain formation or and the chain verification up to a trusted root uh, that the um, uh, verifier got from the manufacturer. Um, uh, uh, but that's kind of a, a a known way of doing this. I mean, that's you know CMS works this way, you know RS mine works this way typically, and and all that. So that's kind of a well understood. So in that case, there's no key ID, there's a key. Um, and uh, uh, FIDO, Android attestation, and and I believe TPM uh, all work this way. Um, so, but this is the worst in terms of the number of bytes on the wire because you're putting a whole X509 cert, cert inside the attestation, which is might be bigger than the attestation. So let me stop there and for comments and questions. Um, this is Dave Thaler. Um, first, uh, well, I have a comment and a clarifying question. So let me ask my clarifying question first. Um, you talked about the, uh, the potential disadvantage of the third row having to uh, decode before verification. Clarifying question, I just want to verify that that does not apply to the fourth row, or does it? Uh, I don't think it does, because if you're using COSE X509, you're putting yeah. the the cert in the, the COSE header, and that's outside the payload, So, gotcha. and, and, and it's well understood that you have to put, look at COSE headers before you ver verify sign signatures. Okay, and then I assume that the, the, the same answer applies to the second row as well, because that's referencing that same draft, right? So those yeah, are things yeah, that go yeah. in the header, right? All right. Gotcha. All right, now I can make my comment. Um, uh, between these, my right now, uh, I don't have a strong preference, but my preference would be to support both the second and the fourth row, meaning for different use cases, because especially if they're both using the same normative reference to allow both of those. But let me explain uh, why. Um, I think it is important to allow for the case where uh, the trust anchor configured in the verifier, like the public key configured in the verifier that it has to chain up to, is not only one step above the uh, attester's signing key. In other words, there's not just one layer that there may be a certificate chain that there may be, you know, two layers or something where the trust anchor signs the key that then signs the attester's signing key. And so whenever we say verification key, I think we should be allowing that to be a certificate chain. And my belief is both the second and the fourth row do that with the same normative reference. And that's why I prefer uh, both of those. And I can think of use cases like for IoT where the second one would be great. And maybe we want to allow the fourth one for cases that number two might be uh, problematic, but that's not a strong preference. But I do have a strong preference of allowing it to be a certificate chain rather than just a single key. Yeah, absolutely agreed where I think that the first and the third one have a harder problem, harder time dealing with certificate chains, but the second and fourth row, the URI and the, uh, when it says uh, typically an X509 certificate or equivalent, my belief is that can be a chain. And so I don't think there's a lot of work necessary just referencing the normative reference and making sure it's usable, so. Yep, yep, totally agree. Um, so, uh, but, but in a way, Dave, you're skipping ahead. Um, th that that's fine. Um, uh, but uh, the, the the thought here is not to standardize this. It's just to say here's some ways you can do it. Um, and 
I believe but that the, doesn't the oh never mind uh, because the the first one you're saying there's already a cose field for yeah the second one there's already a reference for that we can just reference the fourth yeah. one same thing the third one would require additional claims that might be standardizable and that's the one I don't see a case for yet yeah that in my my experience with eat. Um, is everybody really likes the third one, and I have to talk them, <laughs> okay, I have to sorry. talk them out of it, and I haven't succeeded. I don't think I've succeeded once yet. Okay. The, the logic okay. is, you got a UE ID. Why shouldn't we just use that? <laughs> so, anyway, uh, uh, that, that's. I mean, I and and I wanted to have a, a reasonably the, complete taxonomy as well. With the UE ID, my understanding is a device specific key. It's not for the model. It's yes. every instance of that model has a different key, and so yeah, this yeah, is yeah, yeah. The, the way that I look at this is this was this is what you're using to say take evidence, and I've got a set of trust anchors configured, and if there's more than one, how do I know what <laughs> the right one and how to map the evidence to that uh, trust uh, it, uh, trust anchor? So the URI might be there's additional stuff I have to go and fetch in order to provide that connection. Yeah, I mean there could be uh, a giant mapping table. Uh, you know these UEIDs right. map to that that one or the and those uids mapped to the other one the other thing that's that's possible with the uh, with uh key id and based on claims is uh kdfs uh, from uh symmetric keys so the ueid goes into a kdf against a master key to to produce the the uh, verification key so we and we have to we have to accommodate that that kdf scenario so um so, so to get to my my goal of interoperation, uh, in that that loop, you know, then we we do have to pick some of these things and say, yeah, this is the way it should be done. And uh, but that will be, um, you know, I think eat and like Cose, like and like CWT, they've provided a, a large palette of options, and they're not really trying to lock down to a, a specific end and interoperating system. Any other uh, other comments before I go on? Yes. So, so this is Hank. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, the summary here. Um, I'm a little bit torn by the notion that this is uh, informational because it's very useful, and we have for interoperability probably to I don't know find a common denominator, and then the uh, yeah the the uh, open frenzy that is uh, this is not locked down. So so how do you want to? Uh, proceed with this would be my first question and let me add some note here uh i was i was surprised not to see in uh, as a i don't know flavor of three the bay the based on claims the hash of key which is i think the most common claim to refer to a key effectively as we as, as how i saw it maybe that's a very very hank specific scope oh i would just say that's a key id oh so the uri is not then Okay, then I'm surprised. Uh, but uh, okay, no, the but, hash uh, is the first option, the key ID in the first row. I mean, you could put a hash of a key into the URI. Yeah, yeah. So I think I thought the URI is a specialization of key ID, effectively, because key yeah. ID is typically never defined as anything. It's just a string for an arbitrary uh, directory that you can look things up in. And yeah, the URI the, is a valid key for that. <laughs> the, the the URI is more because you, because it identifies where. So the URI is actually a URL. It's a place that you can go and fetch the information that you need. With the key ID, doesn't tell you anything about where to get it. Exactly, so it's a it, URL. It could what be you're a URI, about. which you know, yeah, exactly. If you have a pure data URI or something like that, you could do it in a URI. But the second row is specifically around a URL when it's referencing the Cozy X Five One I. It's similar, uh, since I know Hank, you know suit, right? It's similar to a severable part of the manifest, right? Where you can point mm -hmm. to where you can get it, right? Okay, so effectively, it's not URI; it's URL in the left side column. Then, then I would agree, yes, because the URI yeah, okay. little much <laughs> is a ID. So I was like. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, I, I got this. Under so, description identifies where. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, um, so my my question would be remain to be, um, um, you 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 you, you uh, illustrated the conundrum here. There there are a lot of uh, non not nailed down parts here. How do we uh, enable interoperability then? Well, since I don't have superpowers, one step at a time, <laughs> and, and it may take a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Then that's that. Then maybe stay, stay tuned and we'll help you with this. Thanks. So, 
next step on this is to, to is to write the stuff up in in a pull request against the e draft, um, and then we can uh, you know work through it. So my main objective here was to sort of get a an initial thing like uh, you know is this kind of a good direction or yuck or um, so it sounds like it's kind of a good direction and so I'll I'll start working on uh, write up in the e draft. Um, yeah, I think overall I would just observe that. Um... There's really nothing on the slide that's specific to rats. Everything on the slide is really about, you know, use of COSE and protocols in general. And so I think kind the of, answers yeah. that we're giving for interoperability is just how do you interoperate with COSE in general? There's nothing yeah. really specific on the slide. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's great to reference in EAT, but let's yeah. try not to, I guess my preference would be, let's try not to over-specify it in the EAT document because it's actually not EAT specific. Yeah, it would just be, it's it's more informative uh, at this point in EAT. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, as, as much as possible, just refer to that draft IUTF COSE X509. Yeah. At least that's the protocol, you know, the, the use case agnostic one. And ideally, the answer should all be in there. And so we just have to say how it applies to rats. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I'm, I don't want to run out of time and I have a little, a little bit more. So uh, can I go to the next slide? Okay. So this was, this is my understanding of an endorsement. Um, uh, as far as I know, there's no formal definition of an endorsement, so this is just my assumption. So, you know, it's a mostly static document or file that describes an attester or a class of attesters. It could be a single attester or it could be a class of attesters. So you could have a million endorsements for a million devices or you could have a single endorsement for a million devices. Um, uh, an endorsement endorsement usually contains a public key, which is what's used to do for verification. Um, uh, it may also contain some other information like attribute value pairs that uh, are implicit claims like the model and manufacturer or uh, the um, certifications received by that attester, uh, some description of the security that that, that attester offers. Um, I'm a little unclear about reference values, whether it includes reference values or not at this point, but um, let's just say it does. Um, uh, there, there could be other ways, you you know, you could, the reference values can uh, get to the verifier, but it is possible to do, to do it um, through an endorsement, um, I think. Uh, the endorsements are usually signed by uh, the, the manufacturer of the attester. Um, so that that sort of ensures that they're transferred to the verifier in a secure way. Um, and, you know, we have examples. Uh, we can do X509 based, um, uh, perhaps with some extensions, um, or we could have some new Seabor or COSE uh, based format um, and, or something else. I mean, I just, those are just examples. So that was my kind of my general assumptions of, a, of it, what an endorsement is. Um, Next slide. So now the question is, do we have an identifier for an endorsement in EAT? Um, what, what I just described previously was more of uh, an identifier of keys, not of endorsements. So my proposal here is to add an endorsement ID and an endorsement URL, uh, and I'm using URL in the correct way, I think here, to E. So th there would be new COSE headers, header parameters that one for endorsement ID and then one for endorsement URL. Um, so you could use the endorsement ID if you wanted to, or you could use endorsement URL uh, if you wanted to, um, probably you wouldn't use both. Um, and since an endorsement contains a key, this is an alternative to uh, key identification. Um, uh, right now, EAT has this origination claim. Um, I think this is a replacement for it. I, I don't think the origination claim, I mean, that was a kind of an attempt to go down this path before I understood much about endorsements. Um, so this, we would throw out the origination claim and instead it would be basically replaced by an endorsement URL. Um, so then the question uh, is, do we really want to distinguish between uh, X509 uh, identification and endorsement identification? Um, uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, uh, I'm kind of leaning towards it being distinct because one, um, endorsements may in the future may not be X509. 
Uh, we may choose to do something better. Um, and endorsements uh, have information in them that you might not expect uh, to have in an NX509 cert certificate. So if you get something that, and you know it's an endorsement, you know you look in it and you, you know you look for uh, things like implicit claims. So when you're to, to process in, the, in the, the verification process, or you know you look for reference value. So you, you know that this is supposed to have those things and it might, might be, the, the processing might be different. Um, so uh, the, the format of the um, endorsement, you know, whether it's X5NI or some other format or some other characteristics, you could deal with that in the URL case by the content type in the HTTP, uh, HTTP get. Um, so I'm gonna stop there uh, for comments and see what you guys have to say. I have a comment, uh, this is Ned Smith. Um, is there anything fundamental about the X509 format that prevents it from carrying a, uh, a implicit claim? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I don't know who's next. I since it got quiet and I hand us up, I'll go next. Um, I would uh, propose a slightly alternative approach, or maybe it's a wording modification. Um, if you we uh, think about that diagram that uh, Michael showed with right. uh, the endorser, the reference value provider, the you know policy provider, and so on, um, the there's. Uh, as Michael mentioned, all of those are technically, you know, out of scope for the working group at this time for standardization. Um, and that just means that there may be a lot of different variations of how people do that. And so we need to, so flexibility is important at this point because we can't mandate any particular thing up there because mandating it would be, would, would uh, have something being in scope for normative, which we said is not in scope for normative. So all that is a justification for saying, because there's different ways that endorsements can work and reference value providers and so on, that we need to accommodate multiple models. Um, the use of how do you get the key material overlaps with the URI discussion we were having on that table that we had. Um, what, is, what is not covered in that is how you might have a URI for say, somebody that you get reference values from, which may or may not be the same entity as who you get the uh, you know, verification key search chain from. If you were to rename this as the reference values um, URL, I would be completely happy with this slide. Um, but right now saying endorsements says, well, some people put those in the same place, some people put them in different, in some cases one or the other of those could be the manufacturer, in other cases neither of them is the manufacturer, and so it might be different from, you know, each, orig I don't know, each origination claim, I can't remember how that one's defined. And so um, right now I would propose um, adding a reference value provider um, URI to each if people want to use that, I think that would be great. I think any other approach I would be confused at, so. So, are you saying endorsement ID and reference? Uh, no, no I'm, value saying, ID? I'm saying I don't think that we should use the term endorsement any place in the EAT because there's many different variations of what that is, and trying to shoehorn it into one thing I think is problematic. And so, the I have no problem with the key ID stuff that you had before, which in my personal definition of endorsement, which I think is consistent with what's in the architecture document, the uh, endorsement URI would be the, it, it would be equivalent to the second row of that table before, but that's different from Lawrence's assumption of what endorsement means. And for that, I think you're trying to provide things like reference values. And my, by the way, Ned, my answer does not change the answer to your question, which I still agree with, which is either of them could include implicit claims, Ned, just so you don't have to ask. Thank you. So, so, so to me, an endorsement is is. Yeah, I know your definition of endorsement is different from mine, and is different from what's in the architecture document. But that's not the point here. The point is, what is the information you're trying to get? Okay, you're trying to get some key stuff, but that's covered by the other URI. You're trying to get some reference value stuff, and that I'm probably on board with saying. I agree. You may want to have a URL for that. If the if the verifier doesn't have another way of getting that information, allowing it as optionally to be in the eat, that sounds fine to me. 
So actually, I don't care about reference values. Well, I mean, I do, but the, the proposal <laughs> was was not not to not to go after reference values. It was to go after the key. And since well, then, that's the same as the other URI in the previous table that you had. I don't think that they, we need something different than that. Just the one that's okay. In the well, let me let me give right? you the, the 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 two views on that. So so. so um, an endorsement is different than a key in that an endorsement may have other other data in it, like implicit uh, uh, implicit claims. So it, anytime that you have an X five and nine search chain, this is what I was saying. It doesn't change the answer to to net. If you have an X five and nine search chain that you're going and fetching, that's the URI pointed to by the X five by the COSE X five hundred nine document. There can be LID extensions in there that have implicit claims. There's nothing to prevent that. That was the question that Ned was asking. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you can absolutely do implicit claims in the previous slide. So, so, so I guess what you're saying is, <clears throat> in the case of an X509 certificate, you don't distinguish whether that is in, is just a key or whether it's an endorsement. You assume they're always endorsements, and you always go look for implicit claims in them. Um, if you don't already have them, that's why, you know, the, the difference between the second row and the fourth row is whether the result of what you would have fetched is already cached and provided to you by the, by the attester encapsulated in the EAT, right? If the manufacturer or the endorser or whatever pre-provided all that information such that the verifier just includes it in the EAT, that's fine. That may reduce a round trip from the verifier, so there's cases where you might want to do that. Yes, it makes your EP huge, but it's the same amount of data that comes into the verifier as if you would have had to fetch the extra stuff via HTTPS, and it reduces a round trip in some cases. So that's why I want to allow as an option. But yes, it can have implicit claims in there if it wants. I mean, that's what X5 and I extensions are for, to provide additional information besides just the CP that's signing. Yeah, okay. And um, I mean, I'm not saying that all implicit right. claims what, have to come through an endorsement. It, it, yeah, right. And so that's why I said the the... A uh, case that the previous slide did not cover is where, as the diagram that Michael showed implies, the reference value provider might be different from the endorser. I mean, the thing that's signing the keys might yeah, be different yeah. from the one that's telling you which which values are good, right? Maybe the manufacturer is one of them, and the corporate owner is the second one that has yeah, special yeah. values that it has around, you know, the GPS location or whatever other claims are in there. Yeah, yeah. No, and totally so how do you figure that out? And yeah. so that one, I would think, would be normally, you know, well known, you know, implied in the verifier. But if you need a URI to look it up, I'm all on board with making that be optional. And that's where I think that this slide does have some things I would find valuable as an option to add a, a okay. reference values uh, URI to eat uh, if you need that. Yeah. Okay. And and that would be, you, and you you you'd be good with that as a, a closing header. Yeah. And, and and you can also have implicit claims in the reference values because it's just an X509 search chain. If you want to put them there, that's fine too. So. Yeah, okay. Okay, all right. And so, okay. This, so, what I consider yeah, a friendly I, amendment, you change that. I'm fine. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. I'm going to let this discussion. So um, I think, Hank, you had a comment, but Lawrence, I'm letting you run over. <laughs> um, I'll give you another four more minutes just because there's three other presentations to go after you. Yeah, that's fine. I'm not um, done with my presentation. I'm just, it's just, just for, just for comments now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you had a few more slides. To I think, I, I think they're just extra slides, but anyway, I'm, oh, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I was going to give you a few more minutes. Um, okay, sure. Let's take, let's take comments then. Yeah. Thank <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, if you are doing the uh, referral to a reference value uh, thing, um, then I think the MUT the, the, um, draft uh, that, that was started in REDS is, would be a good uh, pointer about it. It's just a general comic because, uh, because that, that's literally a URL pointing to, to uh, reference uh, values. Um, and also, um, I, just uh, by adding the uh, um, a, a pointer here, uh, and I, I think the reference value pointer would be a different pointer than it is a, an endorsement ID. Endorsement ID is a little bit uh, on the fringe of things because um, because uh, I think that it is mixing uh, endorsement claims a little bit with evidence claims. So it's on the fringe, basically, and and that's a little bit difficult. Uh, also, the uh, slide before this, that is all the assumptions. Um, I would I would make these assumptions uh, not assumptions anymore before proceeding with a plan, 
so the uh, so they are not yeah so because you, you can, I think some of these assumptions do not apply due to a text that is already well defined in the architecture today. And, and we just have to make sure that uh, we are starting from a well-founded uh, starting point here that is a little bit more stable than an assumption. So these would be my two general comments, saving some time with going into details. Okay. And that was, was did you mention the MUD draft? Yeah, yeah. I, I, unfortunately, both interesting drafts to this, like the endorsement eat and the MUD uh, draft I let expire because I had to make a prioritization on what to work on next. Yeah, but okay. I, can, I will revive them in the uh, post, uh, in the moratorium uh, after the moratorium, basically. I will work on them, and uh, we can talk okay. about this in between when when there is cutoff after cutoff. Okay. I think you had some guidance on this. Um, did you want to do the other slides, or are you done? Uh, let's just see what the next slide is. I don't think I had a, oh, yeah, you yeah, had so, a no, no, I'm done. <laughs> okay. So, unless there's no other comments, we should. Harry was in queue. Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, no, I don't have a question. I don't have any comments from these slides. I just have a couple of, uh, general comments to the group. First off, um, from an implement, from an implementer's perspective. Um, we're really relying on E to get finalized, uh, and mainly so that we can uh, nail down the uh, claims registry. Um, there are some other issues that are uh, a little vexing. Lawrence actually posted an issue uh, on on the uh, on how nested uh, submods uh, and nested eats could be conveyed, and these are uh, these are actually uh, eats that are si particularly signed tokens. I'm going to post that uh, that issue. In the uh, in the chat room, please everyone take a look at it and see because um, we've got you know I know internally we've gone through the Cosa specs and we know what's permitted there, but we know what's implementable and Lawrence kind of done a good job of capturing that in the GitHub issue. The second thing, um, and this may also be to the chairs, is um, we need a. We also, from an implementer's perspective, need a, uh, a, a need an approach to unsigned tokens. We've had a UTCS draft that didn't seem to really get moved to the next uh, next stage in the uh, work in the working group. And I'm wondering if there was ever an expression of interest in this or not. Um, I know that there was some debate back and forth as to whether this was necessary. Now the draft has expired. You know, I'm not endorsing one way or another. I just need to. I, we just need to know what we. You know, what is the proper approach for unsigned tokens from an implementer's perspective? So, um, if that needs well, to be so filed as an issue in the eat draft, that's fine. But I don't. But I think it's broader than eat. Yeah. Okay. So I I have to speak as an individual because I'm an author on the unendorsed token. Um, I thought we had taken some feedback. Um, so my interpretation as an individual, not the chair, is that given the feedback, there was some interest that we needed. Uh, there were some comments that we need to address on the draft, and we are looking to update it. But then it's up to, as you said, the chairs to put that that call for interest and adoption for that draft. So, Gary, you're saying you see the need, right? Oh yeah, we support. definitely need a solution for. Uh, we definitely yeah. need a solution for it. Qualcomm is a co-editor of the UCCF document, so that is, so right. that obviously tells right. you what my institution feels about this. So it, it, yeah, I, I think if we could get that call through, uh, yeah, I'd be certainly okay. uh, uh, supportive of that action. So this is Hank. In order to make that call, uh, I have to uh, uh, poke Jeremy again. Uh, Jeremy was a very, a quite a sparse resource in the last month, and that is basically the reason why there is no progress. That is not uh, due to lack of uh, uh, feedback. That is most certainly not due to lack of interest. It is due to lack of uh, author's time to uh, work on this, unfortunately. So I'm I'm poking, and I spoke with Jeremy last week, and we are working on this. There's a plan before cutoff. Uh, yes, sorry for the delay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Gary, this is good to hear because now I'm I'm back as chair. <laughs> I was going to ask the question of um, the interest and intent for any implementations to come up to help 
boost up and raise the issues on on the eat, eat drug. So I hear that at least you are showing interest to implement this and vet out the draft, right? Is that correct? Yeah, and we've also we've we've also gotten uh, like, uh, we've also gotten uh, contact on the eat rats authored voice from the Android group. So we know that that's actually ongoing as well. Good. All right. Thank you for that feedback. Okay, so now we we are definitely. I knew we would eat up the whole ninety minutes. So <laughs> let's move on to the next one. Um, Guy, are you ready? Or or Jess or Eric? Y yes. Yeah. Hi, Nancy. It's Guy. Um, okay. Yeah. So I have a just a short short summary of the uh, Riv progress. Um, <clears throat> we uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, just as a review, of course, it's the, the mechanism for using TPMs in devices like routers to be able to attest the uh, configuration of software and other and other security parameters on a on a remote device. Um, uh, a lot, of, as people know, a lot of the pieces for this already exist, but but uh, what we're trying to do is put them together in a way that you can produce an interoperable uh, function. Um, there was a last call, which ended October the 12th. Um, uh, I should say at this point, thanks to Hank and Wei Pen and Mark Bushke and Bill Sultzen and Dave Thaler and Ira and a few other people for uh, yes. <laughs> for returning uh, comments. Um, so <clears throat> uh, let's move on you what we did. Um, this is uh, Eric's slide again, just to reiterate where this fits into the, into the overall RATS um, architecture uh, activities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so the comments uh, actually added up to almost 700 lines of material, um, not 700 comments, but uh, quite a bit of material. Uh, I've worked through all of them now for first pass, and I think they're um, mostly pretty easy to address, uh, wording and so on. Um, <clears throat> I will check in a new version of the draft uh, to the GitHub uh, today. Um, there is still one more change that needs to be made before I can submit it as 0, 05, uh, and that would be in the next slide. Yes. Uh, uh, so there was mention of this earlier, the definition, oops, endorser, oh well. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the definitions uh, have shifted a little bit. Um, with the split of endorsements into uh, endorsements and reference values. Uh, so that means that in the RIV document where it now says endorser, uh, some of them will say endorser if it refers to an identity or an attestation certificate. Um, uh, but some of them will change to reference value provider if it's used to uh, it's, if it uh, refers to signatures on uh, reference values. Um, coupled with that, uh, as Hank has pointed out, we haven't been terribly careful about <clears throat> what we actually call the reference values. So various documents, I don't think this one has all of them, but various documents have referred to reference integrity measurements, golden values, golden measurements, known good values, and a few other things. So I will attempt to Get at least all of the capitalized ones changed to reference values, um, which would be signed by a reference value provider. Um, that change is yet to be done, but when I, when we get through that one, then uh, I'll be able to check it in for uh, as version five. Uh, and uh, I understand at that point, then I will pull the <clears throat> pull the working group again and the and the commenters to ask if their comments have been addressed adequately. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you need to poll, but you do need to reach out to the commenters and make sure yes. that they've addressed. Yeah. Um, okay. 
And if you can do that and on the list, that way I can see the confirmation and yep. then we can move forward to, to publication. Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, and that's basically what it says on the next slide, I think. Um, oh. So yeah. <clears throat> it would be uh, finishing, finish the editing tasks. And then I should stop here and ask if there are any other questions or comments that should be addressed in, the, in, in completing this document. I think the the chair may say hearing none, we shall move on. <laughs> I, I was waiting, I was doing the pause. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so um, Guy just, well, you're gonna post a draft and then um, just send out to the list that you've updated it and yeah. um, poke the, the folks that, you know, provided you the, the comments and make sure that they have yeah. been addressed. Um, and I will keep an eye on that to make sure. Okay. We're done. Well, again, thank you all for the, for the remarks on the thing. I, I think the result is, is better. Good. All right. So unless there's any other comments or questions on this draft, we can move on to, I think the next one is Hank. Hi, everyone. Uh, is my audio fine? Yes. Excellent. So yeah, this is a uh, uh, report on the status of uh, the reference interaction model uh, ID. Uh, also with extension, of course, to the uh, co-authors Liquid and Christopher, which are not here today. Um, next slide, please. So the, the, just a um, tiny recap. Uh, so uh, uh, we have um, uh, three interaction models, and this now uh, uh, suddenly um, aligns relatively well with the examples that Dave was talking about beforehand, um, because somehow the uh, the protocols that in the end in solutions will ensure some of the freshness characteristics that Dave elaborated on before uh, are captured here in this document. They are more detailed. They are uh, provide a small information model about the things that uh, are, are conveyed over the wire, uh, virtual wire, and um, and also uh, some prerequisites uh, to the entities that want to implement protocols. So the things that are uh, transmitted here uh, are not necessarily parts of the conceptual messages defined in the architecture. Um, these uh, things can be part of the protocol itself. So, uh, so this uh, demarcation line is therefore dissolved here a little bit, and uh, it is talking about what information elements have to be conveyed in the pro on the protocol level. Again, ex uh, extending the scope, exceeding the scope of conceptual messages uh, by principle. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, again a small recap. Uh, as this uh, is uh, has an impact on all the information conveyed and available to attestors and verifiers with respect to uh, evidence, for example, uh, direct anonymous attestation is covered in this document uh, specifically because it can be uh, easily described here. It is uh, a de implementation detail and therefore not suited for the architecture, and it can be used by multiple solutions and therefore would have would be reiterated there as well. So uh, the, the, the intent of the uh, reference document is, again, to provide references, and therefore DEAA is on the same uh, semantic level and uh, included here. Next slide, please. So what has happened? Uh, well, the document was uh, adopted. It is now a working group item. Uh, it also also uh, updated quite recently, aka in the last three hours. Um, um, what has happened there is that uh, now, as there was changes to the architecture, uh, specifically to the reference values and the reference value provider role, um, there uh, was uh, uh, changes in, in wording here uh, correspondingly. Um, also, some other things like we are talking now always consistently with the generation of evidence that has happened here, and uh, uh, we have uh, um, a strong relationship to the attesting and at, uh, target 
environment here uh, because uh, the evidence created uh, uh, is about uh, the target environments. And uh, in order to scope that with uh, not a lot of words, uh, uh, it is assumed that the reader is familiar with section 4.3 of the architecture, which is highlighted in the beginning of the document. That, of course, uh, is not entirely necessary. You can read it by its own, but uh, the overview uh, in, in the arts architecture helps a lot. So that is uh, documented now. Um, uh, in general, this document is now used by uh, three other documents, uh, four actually, the other documents, two of them adopted and two of them uh, in queue as related documents. Next slide, please. So that's actually the gist of what, uh, what this talk is about next to the report that I just uh, stormed through. Um, there are two interesting sections with normative language in this document. <laughs> One of them is called relatively obviously normative prerequisites, which is about the uh, uh, non-architectural but somehow always useful concept that has to be enabled for protocol use. Um, this is uh, primarily about the attester. Uh, with everybody who has skimmed the architecture in the last year should probably be uh, somehow uh, re recognized or be familiar with the concepts in section six. And my first uh, ask for review would be about that. And that is the first place where normative language really becomes relevant in this, uh, in this, in this document. And uh, it is uh, the question, of course, is, is is it applicable to the things that you envision for your implementation if you are if you are uh, following that? So uh, so if you are interested in in creating a solutions, have a solution um, uh, review would be very very uh, appreciated. Uh, the the focus here is uh, does this match? Uh, or is something mandatory here or something required here that is never ever to be uh, uh, um, be realized in a solution that you think of? Uh, that, of course, would be somehow uh, uh, has to be taken into account. The normative language would change probably or or maybe uh, there is an interesting inconsistency uh, for, for a point of view. So that is uh, uh, the first ask. Uh, and the second ask is pretty much uh, similar. Uh, I was talking about the uh, most essential items that are conveyed via protocols here. Again, exceeding the scope of the conceptual messages as defined in the architecture, maybe. And uh, again, there's some uh, normative language here. And uh, it may it, it is very important that we are not being uh, arbitrarily exclusive here and somehow pushing out uh, very meaningful and useful concepts by mandating something uh, that would be... Uh, uh, absolutely beside the point. Um, again, the intent was not to do that uh, and be very careful and minimal, but nobody knows. Uh, there can be uh, fringe cases that uh, are more important than you thought of something, and maybe we have a, a generic uh, discrepancy in general. So, so there would be another ask for a review about Section 7 here, which are the generic information elements. And uh, I will restate that uh, request for review on the list. Um, I think it's a good uh, uh, point to start uh, uh, making this document uh, ready for working group last call inside the uh, stream of this uh, working group. Any questions about that? Um, so this is Dave. Uh, I mm -hmm. don't know if there's anything we can do about it. It does seem a bit odd that we have normative stuff in a document that's listed as status informational. Um, oh, is but, it? But, yes. But, Huh. I mean, we, we, we can have the discussion whether, so. Yeah, so we should, the, the, time, review, <laughs> right, the review is required, and then we can make a determination as to whether this really merits it being standard, oh. right? Or whether the yeah. language really needs to be normative. So uh, Dave, indeed. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Dave, have you read the document? Well, I mean. I have not read the document that was posted three hours ago, no. Yeah. No, I, I didn't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> this meeting started, as you know, at Pacific Time, 7.30. No, I did not spend time reading the three hours old uh, document yeah. right before the meeting. Sorry. Apologize no for sense. that. Uh, I, I'm a little bit out of date here. I'm at least three hours out of date. Sorry. My apologies. Yeah, no, no, but you understand my my um, my comment. Uh, I, right. I called it up on the screen when uh, Hank had this put the slide up, and that's the extent to which I looked at it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that at said, at, at, at um, this version, I, I read an earlier version from you know last year or whatever, but the but the version that he's presenting right. now. You read the version that led to its adoption, right? Yes, yes. Um, so, 
Yeah, I given that it was only three hours ago, even the folks in who are not in the Pacific time zone, I would not expect them to have read them unless they were really um, in tune to it. Yeah, then there are no structural changes to the content, so uh, it, it doesn't hurt, uh, especially. But there, there are, I don't think there is anything uh, semantically changed to the to the concept at all. So, so this was all uh, alignment of terminology and alignment of of structure. So that is everything. I did. Okay, so Hank, you should put out the. You know, um, I haven't checked my mail, so I didn't see the update go through on on the mail. Usually you get the new draft announcements, um, uh, but did. do ask for that review yeah, and then we can. It, it did, did go up, I got it, yeah. I, so Dave, I, I've been in meetings. I, I saw it before the meeting, so. <laughs> I've been in meetings at six this morning. <laughs> All right, so um, Hank, let's continue the discussions and then hopefully by, um, you'll get some comments by the ITF 109. Um, and then we can figure direction and readiness. Ah, I'm, I'm unmuted. Okay, so yeah, exactly. So I was targeting for feedback phase uh, uh, starting now. So I will issue the official request on the list. Um, yes. We have time before the cutoff and then even still. So I think that is a good uh, time frame for uh, feedback. And yeah, that I will uh, do accordingly. So good. All right, we're actually doing good on time. So unless there's any other comments, we'll move on to the Chara draft. Eric, I think you, you're you on the queue to present. Yes, I am on behalf of the other authors. Um, yes. We have update three to Chara. Next slide. Basically, the idea behind Chara, just as a recap, is that a lot of network devices use Yang interfaces, and we want to make sure that that Yang interface can be standardized across as many operators as possible. This draft identifies the remote procedure calls and a data store for implementing access to and from TPM 1.2 and TPM 2.0 RPCs. The big thing that's happened uh, in the latest uh, Incarnation is that we passed our most recent copy of the Yang uh, model to the Yang doctors and the draft of the Yang doctors. They should be coming back any day. They should have been here yesterday, but that's again uh, a little early. We're waiting to see what their comments are to see how to progress, hopefully, towards working group last call. Next slide. This draft fits in uh, behind some of the other drafts that were discussed today, such as what uh, was discussed by the RIV draft that uh, Guy presented, as well as dependencies on the interaction model draft that Hank just described. Um, next slide. Now, there were a number of issues addressed. Uh, first, in the overall document, there was text added to describe the purpose and the content and context of this particular Yang model. There are people who can read Yang models and know what's going on. Most people are not like that. So just trying to identify what is in the Yang model and being able to break it out was uh, a big change to the last draft. Within the Yang model, as we discussed at the last uh, working group meeting, uh, we changed to the TCG algorithms away from um, a integration of the TCG and the ITF algorithms and we created a number of error checks around them. We added stuff that was uh, requested by WayPan and others for NetEquip boot, new log types. We also refined the model to in eliminate many types of redundancies and sources of configuration error. That's the biggest change that has occurred is just trying to get away from strings and make them enumerations and other kinds of types. Additionally, there were redundant elements that probably weren't needed in the RPCs and allowing them to be pulled out by a Yang fetch rather than being sent on every RPC seemed as a way to just simplify the amount of development needed for somebody on the development side. Uh, also along that line, we removed the key establishment RPC since people can establish keys in other ways. There's descriptive text added in the model. And we also added a bunch of high level containers just to make sure things grouped a little bit more cleanly by people doing read and write. 
that's the main issues addressed. Next slide. There's a number of open issues, uh, and these are the ones that I think are gating working group last call. First one is some of the expressions to do configuration uh, uh, validation before writing to a data store have to be reviewed and added to. Um, a couple of us made some guesses, but the uh, XPath, for those of you who used it, is fairly abstruse. I'll use that word. And trying to get somebody who really knows XPath to see if we got it right is something that we're looking to do. So if there's anybody who wants to volunteer to do a little XPath, please ping the authors and the working group because we could use some help. We are asking the Yang doctors themselves to get help. I'm hoping that they can do it themselves. Second thing is um, we want to make sure that any Yang doctor comments we get are addressed. Uh, I've been on the other end of Yang doctor comments before, and there will be some. And we're going to have to wait till they come in before we do that. So that's an open issue. Um, there's one open issue on trying to maximize the commonality between the TPM 1.2 and TPM 2.0 RPCs. We haven't actually been able to track down the person who built the original code for the 1.2 RPC. And uh, we're trying to simplify away things that we don't believe are necessary. But we've been making some requests for people who would be able to Ver verify for using 1.2 that we've got the minimum set of fields requiring standardization. And I think that making sure the quotes are as close as possible would be positive. We just got to make sure that whoever wants this has their experts review the model. Now, the biggest open question, at least for today, is one that's been going back and forth on do we include more stuff such as the TPM name and the node ID in the RPCs. What a node ID is for is if you have mobile line cards, you have to identify which line card is necessary. Is that essential to be included in the RPCs, as is the TPM name? And that's the main issue I want to chat about on the next slide. So I put a slide together to try to explain the issues. I, I think that the structure on the top, what it does, it says we can uniquely identify a TPM based on a certificate name. We must know the certificate or we cannot evaluate what comes out signed from that TPM. So the certificate name is a requirement for understanding what is coming back from the RPC. And it is assumed to be unique. And uh, you know you only will change and add this to the RPC when you have a subset of TPMs that you want to get information from. If you just query the RPC, it's going to assume give me everything. It's the only time in the RPC you want to actually indicate that you need a subset of the TPMs to attest is when you list let's say the certificates to say, give me information relating to this certificate. So uh, the alternative which has been discussed and uh, we're, we're still awaiting comments is instead of identifying the certificate, what if we identify the TPM name and the node ID? Um, you know, this is an alternative which could work. Uh, the con to this, uh, there's a few con is that you have to identify node IDs, and you don't have to know node IDs on a device, but you definitely still have to know the certificates that are there. So perhaps that um, that might be additional. Um, and then the TPM names, again, you might not know, need to know the TPM names uh, because if you know the certificate names, you can get to them by reference, as is shown in the top. On the output side, again, do you want to repeat all the information along with TPM and node ID? We could add these things. Uh, it would just mean that you are providing output, which you could also get from the uh, from the RPC. So the question really is uh, for right now, and hopefully for the list, if we don't have anybody chiming in uh, beyond the, the comments you've seen so far, is do we want to have more redundancy or more additional information in the RPC and the response, or do we want to keep it as minimal as possible? My preference is option one, that's what's in the current model, but I want to make sure that everybody who has uh, said that they are interested in having 
additional information with IRPC has a chance to, to chime in before, before we close this. So that's the big question that is the open question. And I wanna see if anybody on the call has any comments on it. Again, the recommendation I have is one, just because it's simpler and easier for the operator. Hi, Eric, this is Wei Pan. And uh, uh, I think uh, the option one is the uh, current uh, design of the uh, current version. And uh, have you noted, uh, I noticed that uh, even uh, in the option one, in the output part, uh, there is there are node ID, uh, and uh, is that uh, for, uh, have some does that have some specific purpose to have that in the output? Because you know, uh, if you can use certificate name to uh, to 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 get the TPM name and the node ID, why you still uh leave the node id in the output i think that was just a uh the latest version it hasn't been updated i i was planning on pulling node id out um i just haven't yet so whatever people decide i'm happy to have it being redundant but my expectation is that it is not required okay and uh uh actually in my um assumption or imagination, I think um, uh, both options are um, are not very, how to say, uh, both have their pros and cons. And uh, uh, option one may be more, uh, more, maybe better for, for people to read and uh, option two uh, may be more easy for the machines to uh, process, but uh, I, but I don't think they are they are have many uh, huge uh, disadvantages for both options, and uh, uh, I'm fine with both, and um, uh, and that's my opinion. Yeah, right. agreed. Again, I wouldn't be that upset if we did option two. I just want to minimize what is needed for the developer. That's that's really it. Uh, maybe okay. for uh, uh, about the uh, option two, maybe um, in such a case uh, in the composite device um, scenario, uh, when the leader tester uh, doesn't, uh, you know, when the leader tester only has, uh, doesn't have the capability of hand, handling the young uh, data stores. Maybe it's uh, there is another component to do the to handle the uh, young data stores. And in such case, uh, the option option two option one may have more process required between the uh, leader tester and the uh, young components. And uh, in such case, I think uh, option one may uh, option two may be easier. The, that is a possibility. In, in that case, you still have to know what TPM names are from the Yang model. So they're not in an ID, which you would understand. The node ID and the TPM name, if you don't know them, they're not going to provoke, or you can't get access to Yang, you still would have to understand what they're for. So they'd still be um, requiring extra external coordination. So, you know, we can talk about it more on the list, but it sounds like both are okay. Um, sounds like if you don't know Yang, uh, you still have to get unique identifiers for your line cards, and that can come just as well from certificate name. Um, anyway, so um, again, if people or if you want to add more to the list, we can see if we can close things out. There is an open thread on this, and uh, be happy to chase that particular one down. Yeah, Eric, I was going to ask, I don't remember seeing it on the on the list, but putting it there and then getting the conclusion there would be good. Yep, there is a uh, current discussion uh, on this with, uh, it was Bing Cao, I, I tried to pull his name up. Ah, okay. So, no so let's go to that discussion. 
So any, you want the any other slide? questions? I can do the last slide uh, or, or concerns. Uh, I'm hoping that once we get these um, next slide, once we get these uh, issues closed, especially the Yang doctors and the XPath, then we can go do a working group last call. Um, I have a yeah, this is Hank. I have a clarifying question for slide six. Sure. Um, are both options of option one and option two mutual exclusive? Or can one option be somehow tinkered as a redundant thing into the other option? Because to me, it doesn't look that way, but I think I heard that as a possibility. Well, uh, the question of how much redundancy do you want to have is there. If you added all yeah. the objects, you could do it. But the thing is, then you have a lot more errors to check because is the certificate name matching the TPM name? What if they're different? What if the node ID is different? So you just have much more complexity that probably is going to drive more errors than forcing people to take something back if you just use certificate names. So I think that the flexibility here actually drives more error conditions in the API than you'd want to support. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think that elaborates the, the actual pro and con. Thank you. <laughs> All right, other questions? All right, that's it for me. Cool. Thanks. Um, so I think that was our last presentation. So unless there's any other issues or comments to be raised, we can finish five minutes early. Going once, going twice. All right. Thank, Thank you, you all. And uh, don't forget if you haven't uh, put your name on, on the um, Cody MD for the attendance. All right, so with that, um, I'll see you guys in IETF 109. Have a good weekend. Thank you.